everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, hello and welcome to the event. Um, my name is Jennifer Bratter and I'm a professor of sociology and I'm here to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silva. Tonight's event is co-sponsored between the Center for African and African American Studies or CAS and Rice University's initiative on inequality called BRIDGE, which stands for Building Research on Inequality and Diversity to Grow Equity that I direct. We are excited to bring Professor Bonilla Silva's lecture to you today, as his scholarship has brought the a critical conversation that is at the heart of the mission of both CAS and BRIDGE. In the wake of the reckoning with racial justice that has unfolded over this past summer, Bridge and Cass, alongside Rice's Task Force on Slavery and Segregation and Racial Injustice, entered a statement of solidarity to create, quote, a cur curricular, programmatic, and research initiatives mindful of targeting anti-Black racism and systemic violence to both increase knowledge of the systemic problem and foster imaginative efforts towards resolution. This lecture represents a key effort toward that promise. And so to get us started, I'd like to begin with a simple question. What is racism? Is it an attitude conveying severe bias towards a person based on their race? Is it a set of beliefs about a people of specific races based on stereotypes? Is it ill-intentioned actions like saying a racial slur? Or is it something subtler? Does it lie in hearts and minds, actions or behaviors, or does, does it live or does it live more in stable places, such as structures or systems? These are old and new questions. Anyone who has thought at all about racism must wrestle first with what, what, does, it, what does the term mean and if or how we can explain, if or how we can use it to explain what we see around us. In today's world, we continue to wrestle. For all the value placed in a diverse and equitable society, we still live in a world where racism continues to exist. And now in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of reckoning with, with social justice, we see in glaring detail how race truly divides life and the value placed on it. And how we understand racism could not be, any, could not be more important to our present day circumstances and the work of our, current, of our speaker today has never been more necessary. Professor Bonilla Silva's work is nothing short of foundational to the modern understanding of racism as an ongoing production. In short, he is a scholar who gives clarity to this concept, pointing to the ways racism operates covertly, structurally, ambiguously, but despite its ever-changing face and shape, its impact is sustained and destructive. Bonilla Silva has traced these dynamics over nearly a 30 year career. He is the James B. Duke Professor of Sociology at Duke University. He received his BA in Sociology with a minor in Economics in 1984 from the Universidad de, de Puerto Rico. He received his MA in 1988 and his PhD in 1993 from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And he's taught at University of Michigan, Texas A&M before joining Duke University in 2005. To date, he has published five award-winning books, White Supremacy and Racism in the Post-Civil Rights, in the Post-Civil Rights Era, Racism Without Races, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in the United States, with a sixth edition coming out in 2021, White Out, The Continuing Significance of Racism, White Logic, White Methods, Racism and Methodology, and State of White Supremacy, Racism, Governance in the United States. He has also published over 40 peer-reviewed articles and numerous book chapters and essays. His work appears across leading journals in the field of sociology, theory, Latin American studies, and political science. His work truly speaks to multiple audiences. And his work, as it should come as no surprise, has won several major awards granted to the top work in the field, multiple times from the American Sociological Association. From the Lewis Kozer Award given by the theory section in the American Sociological Association for theoretical agenda, agenda setting, 
as well as the Cox Johnson Frazier Award given by the American Sociological Association to quote, an individual or individuals for their work in the intellectual traditions of Oliver Cromwell Cox, Jar Charles Johnson and E. Franklin Frazier, three African-American scholars. And he has also served to shape the discipline as the president of the so Southern Sociological Society and the American Sociological Association. Now there's a lot more to say about the career of Pro Professor Bonilla Silva, but we wanna give him time for his lecture. So I will end with this. Talking about racism is not easy work. It is not happy work and it is often draining work. It requires unsettling long held assumptions, creating disruption that often leaves audience members, readers and even scholars to ask, am I racist? Have I done racist things? Have I contributed to systems of oppression that have impinged the lives of other people? And many, of the many times the answer is often maybe or even yes. Bonilla Silva's career in both speaking and writing and teaching have demonstrated the need for this most challenging and uncomfortable conversation. And because real change can't happen without it. And with that, please join me in welcoming to this virtual stage, Professor Bonilla Silva. Okay, let me see if this is working. Okay, Andrew, that's what I was telling you that. Okay, it's, it's working. <laughs> Good, that, Jennifer, that's exactly what I need. Okay, so the title of my lecture is What Makes Systemic Racism Systemic? And I want to begin by two things. First, Zoom talks ain't the same, let's be honest. We try and we try to do the best we can, but usually it's not a BAM! And right on that is like boring, which is the name of a Oregon. I didn't know that. And I'm good, but I'm not black Puerto Rican Superman. So I'll try to keep it light and at the same time deep, which is a, a talk about ambivalence, Jennifer. Hard to do both things well, but I'll try. The second thing I want to know is the obvious that talking about racism these days is sensitive, particularly because many whites feel that we're attacking them, which is not my purpose. I'm here to fulfill an educational goal. I want you to have a better understanding about what racism is all about, how it works in contemporary America. And I, I want you to end uh, tonight thinking about the systemic nature of racism. Of course, although my fundamental goal is educational, if you are moved by what I had to say, think about what kind of things you, as well as Rice University, as an organization, can do to improve uh, racial affairs in our nation. So I want you to relax because one of my big points today is that most of us are sort of unconscious, habituated participants in systemic racism. But do not relax too much, okay? So this is what I'm going to do. Quickly discuss what racism is all, systemic racism is all about. And in the PowerPoint is going to be referred as SR how systemic racism operates in contemporary America. What is the ideological expression of systemic racism in the contemporary moment? How systemic racism is embedded in organizations such as universities, which I call historically white colleges and institutions. And then at the end, the most sensitive part so I'm going to alert you when we're getting into point five, that's when you're going to get mad with me, but don't worry. We're together. So how do we all participate in systemic racism and what needs to be done? Okay, so what is systemic racism? Remember, it used to be so easy. Systemic racism is about bad people, yeah? It's the Klan, it's the neo Klan. And lately we have been referring to that as the uh, bad apple theory of racism. In economics, and my minor was in economics, so I, I read G Gary Baker back in the day, so he talks about people having a taste for discrimination. And to repeat something that I will say three times tonight is, the trick for us is understanding that systemic racism is ultimately reproduced by the actions and inactions of all of us. Mm -hmm. All of us participate. And I will then explain that the participation is not symmetrical. Whites and non-whites 
all participate, but in different positions and therefore with different uh, outcomes. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, everybody is talking about systemic racism, so why should we be talking about this when all of us agree? And I'm going to suggest tonight that most folks who use the term don't know what they're talking about, including Joe Biden, uh, who in a debate two weeks ago said that the police department have systemic racism and immediately caveated his statement by saying, but most police officers are not racist. It, going back, I think, to the traditional definition of racism as a matter of bad actors, yeah? In truth, the outcomes of policing in America are the product of the selection of police officers, the training they receive, their culture, the racialized authority, even the militarization of police departments that occurred in the US after the 1960s, yeah? So all these things all but guarantee that any police officer will carry out race-based policing. And I wanted to give you a liminal example, an example that will test my argument. This young African-American uh, male was brutalized by police in Atlanta in June. Here are the police officers that committed the act. As you can see, most of them were black police officers, only one was white. And some of you probably are already thinking, but black people cannot. And the truth is, the day, first, the data shows that black police officers are as likely as white to engage in police brutality. And that's because historically, the system, systemic racism has incorporated some people of color in the process. Same as capitalism tries to incorporate some workers and patriarchy as a system tries to incorporate some women in the process, yeah? And that process that started in slavery, I'll give you an example later, continues today. Of course, in average, the enforcers of, of the system happen to be white and not all of them wear a police uniform. In truth, as I will argue tonight, the average person, white person, participating in enforcing racial order, and you have this RWF, that means regular white folks who discipline people of color in streets, in parks, selling lemonade in a stand. If you are a graduate student at Yale in sociology, like happened to this young African-American woman who was told, hey, you're sleeping here, this is not the place for you. And like, I'm a student, I'm like, you don't look like a student, yeah? <clears throat> now, of course, thankfully, uh, whites are changing and historically there have been fractures in the white team so some whites have fought against white supremacy from slavery onwards, yeah? But change also goes in a different direction, yeah? That person in the middle, Enrique Tarrio, is the leader of the Proud Boys. And he's of Cuban descent, and he's actually a dark-skinned Cuban. So here you have an example where the system incorporates folks of color. So when we think about systemic racism, we have to think about the system being historically specific. So Professor Dominguez is from Brazil. Brazil has a racial order that is somewhat different from the racial order of the US. I'm from Puerto Rico, born in the USA, but raised in Puerto Rico. And we do have a racial order different to the one in, in the US, probably closer to the system in Brazil. Yeah? So we have to be very, very specific. Second, we have to understand that systemic racism is precisely systemic because it's collective. And these practices and behaviors, which I claim are collective, produce advantage for some and disadvantage for others. And if you have a system that produces advantage for some, that means that those people receiving benefits are going to have an interest in defending the racial order of things. And the defense of the racial order of things to get beyond my talk tonight, doesn't have to be proud boy style, yeah? The defense can be passive or you can be a silent beneficiary so long as you don't fight to change the racial structure, yeah? So historically, you can check how many whites fought against the system or just passively kept sort of talking like if nothing was happening. So therefore, systemic racism refers to social, political, economic, cultural, and even psychological rewards partially allocated by race. And I say partially because in modernity, actually, 
throughout human history, categories such as race or class or gender have been working together. Uh, like my favorite ice cream in, in the world, Chunky Monkey. They're all together, yeah? <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> That's what I was talking about. So systemic racism is about collective practices and behaviors rather than the matter of a few races. So systemic racism is part of the wealth system as as race was invented at Sudbury in the late uh, 1500s, early 1600s, all societies in modernity were shaped to various degrees and ways by systemic racism. But I want to address the specifics of the US here. Yeah? And this is the uh, basics of US history. Yeah? So we did have slavery, more importantly, in terms of historical order. Before slavery, we had uh, land theft and genocide committed against indigenous peoples. Yeah? Uh, we also had classical sort of imperialism. We took today a third of what is today the US used to be Mexico until 1848. Mexico lost to US imperialism half of its national territory. And of course, besides this internal stuff that some people don't even read as imperialism, we have classical imperialism, where the US went beyond its borders and uh, colonized places like Puerto Rico in the Spanish-American War. Yeah? And here is Trump in, uh, when was it, Hurricane Maria, 217, something that I take quite personally because my mother was one of the 3,000 people who died as a consequence of the hurricane. And his idea was a colonial mentality. Can I divest from this asset? Lately, literally a month ago, we learned from one of his assistants that he thought about trading Puerto Rico for Greenland. Yeah. So those of you, you know, young uh, folks, remember when we used to have a uh, baseball cards and we used to trade. I traded Roberto Clemente for, no, I don't trade Roberto Clemente, he's Puerto Rico. But we used to do that, yeah. And then, of course, racialization may have begun in the US in the 18th century, but racialization is a continuous process. So we're still racializing newcomers, yeah, and rethinking who belongs where. So the material foundation has an economic uh, element. And you notice that I put economic in quotation marks because I'm going to suggest that the material foundation is economic, but it's also beyond purely economic interest. Yeah. So historically, we know that white folks have gotten a better economic deal in terms of income. Throughout the 20th and 21st century, the gap in income has been about what, 30, 40 percent. Yeah. So whites usually make significantly more than than blacks and Latinos. But as important as the income difference is, the most important gap is the wealth gap. Here you have data for 1983 and 216. So in two, in 1983, the gap was, you know, we had 15% of the net worth of whites. And in 216, we did, were doing worse than we were doing in 1983. So talk about progress, yeah? What is the impact for today? That explains that now when people are losing their jobs, because we have very little wealth, the likelihood of us rebounding from COVID-19 and its economic effects for people of color is really uh, limited. Because if you don't have any wealth, what can you do? And these economic disparities are not due to education, lack of effort, culture, all kinds of arguments that some social scientists have argued to account for the difference, yeah? I think the difference are the product of the fact that race matters in all areas of life. Race matters when you are at Wendy's or Burger King, yeah? Who is going to be the, the manager and who is going to be flipping burgers? When you work at Walmart or you're a janitor or you're in the meat packing industry, you're a doctor, lawyer. I was talking today about plumbers and electricians, because that's a working class job. And people assume that there is equality in the working class. And in truth, that's not what the data shows. The data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics 220 shows that blacks are underrepresented both as plumbers and electricians. And that's because 
they are trade schools and in the trade schools the teachers do not recommend you to be an apprentice for, to the white plumber or the white electrician because the white plumber and the white electrician test the teacher don't send me tyrone don't send me eduardo send me kevin <laughs> send me a white person yeah so if you want more on that please read the book by didri royster on this matter and of course race matters in the academy and i'll talk more about that later now i already mentioned that economic interests alone do not explain systemic racism besides money <laughs> we humans do not live on bread alone so the racialized order gives whites better access to neighborhoods colleges and parks better social estimation given that the culture heralds whiteness if you are white, the police is on your side, and I'm going to show you a picture, and you have seen this picture before, but I alert you, it's uh, disturbing. So on the left, you have uh, Dylan Roof, when he was arrested. You remember Dylan Roof was a young white uh, supremacist who killed nine people in a church in South Carolina. So he had killed six people. He was armed, and look, he was arrested without incident. On the way to the police station, he complained that he was hungry. So the police stopped in Burger King and purchased a burger for him. On the right, you have George Floyd. And we all know that he was lynched uh, kept, uh, for eight minutes and 46 seconds in that position. If you are white, you can barbecue in a park, watch birds in a park, sell water, lemonade, sleep in a couch, speak Spanish in New York City or Houston without concern that somebody will tell you, hey, you cannot do that here. So not surprisingly, as I suggested, whites develop an interest in defending the of things. I immediately alert you, but change may be coming. Yeah? Things are changing. Social movements matter. Black Lives Matter may produce change. And I say may because we don't know the end of history. At this point, we are assuming that this will lead to systemic changes but we have been in this movie before, and sometimes movements don't produce outcomes, or at least a desirable outcome. So let's talk about the nature of contemporary systemic racism as a system of practices. And in my work, I have argued that the system of racism that emerged in the 1960s, 1970s, is fundamentally different from the Jim Crow period, where things were in your face, yeah? Clear, overt. And I think that the new system, fundamentally, the practices of discrimination and exclusion are covert, smiling discrimination. So I still remember, uh, uh, oh, you, you, Jennifer mentioned it. I used to work at Texas A&M, and I, I went to an Albertson uh, supermarket. Do they still have Albertsons? No? So. OK. OK, so I went to an Albertson supermarket, and I went to pay with a check. So I gave the check, gave my ID. The person looked at me, the white clerk, and she asked me, do you have another form of ID? I'm like, actually, no, I just have my driver's license. And I also have my, my, my card from the university. And she asked me, gee. So I'm like, I've never been asked for this. And then she told me, it is store policy. Later on, one of my students who worked in the store told me, that's a lie, it's not store policy. They decide that when they see a person of color, they assume this person is going to steal my stuff, yeah? Okay, uh, secondly, avoidance of racial terminology. So we know that in public exchanges, the language of the past, of the Jim Crow era, is for the most part not used, yeah? Doesn't mean that the N word and other horrible words are not used, is that they're not used in public exchanges for the most part. The racial agenda, which used to be in your face, overt, clear, now is a little bit more covert. So there is a new language to talk about race. So you talk about welfare reform, and it has a disparate impact on people of color. But by calling welfare reform, it seems to be like a, something universal when in truth is a targeted policy. Or you talk about inner city problems or inner city people. And everybody knows what we're talking. But by saying that, you always have plausible deniability. Then 
many of the mechanisms are sort of invisible in the reproduction of racial inequality. So for example, police surveillance and brutality until recently was invisible to the white masses because it happened in neighborhoods and neighborhoods are segregated, yeah? So whatever happened in the, uh, in the black neighborhood, most, of, most whites didn't know or learn weeks later. And by then the news cycle had moved on. So here is the, one of the cases that we all remember of Eric Garner in New Jersey. Yeah? And things changed because of the cell phone technology. So now everybody is armed with the weapon of the cell phone. And we assume that because we have cell phones and we have videos that that will uh, limit the likelihood of this violence happening uh, again and again and again. However, we have learned that despite the video technology, things keep happening. And lastly, some of the old strategies of the Jim Crow era have been re-articulated. The old, Daniel is a historian, so he appreciates this. The old never dies completely. It may be re-articulated. So in this case, the old practice of redlining that some of you are familiar with, it has been re-articulated and is still unfortunately in practice, yeah? So that means that if I live in, give me a black neighborhood in Houston, the fourth ward, yeah? And I try to buy in uh, the woodlands, yeah? Or in the heights, they will tell me, well, based on your profile, meaning you come from the fourth ward, I will give you a worse loan. Net of my economic profile. And the impact of that for wealth accumulation is humongous. Because if I cannot afford a similar house as my uh, economic white peer, the impact is that I will not accumulate a lot of money. And the number one asset for wealth accumulation among most of us is not Wall Street, for friends, as our president says, it is your home. So if you are not allowed to get equality in the housing market, it has a tremendous impact in your wealth accumulation. So new racism affects everything we do, schools. So I'm thinking of in the past, it used to be, you know, I want to move into a white neighborhood and they planted a bomb or they have a, a, a housing covenant. When I bought my first house in Bryan College Station, it had, it used to have a, a covenant and the people just black, <laughs> block it with a, a magic marker, yeah? So I still could read through the marker what it said, but it was no longer part of the, of the contract, yeah? And in the past, in terms of exclusion in, in schools, it was again in your face. Yeah, you have pictures of the 1950s. Today, different. If you are trying to buy, uh, you're in the, in the market for a house and you tell your realtor, I want to, can you show me racially mixed neighborhoods in Houston? Your realtor will tell you, oh, I don't talk about race, it's illegal. Except that, by the way, except that we know that realtors engage in a practice called racial steering, where they literally take people, and if you are white, they show you white uh, neighborhoods. If you are black, black neighborhoods. And if you, uh, actually there was a paper, Jennifer, written by a postdoc at, at Rice, fabulous paper, yeah? Because she tracked the process from beginning to end and showed the significance of race from the beginning to the end. And here you have housing discrimination new style. This is Trump in the 1970s. His family, along with 184 other companies, they were sued by the federal government because they were discriminating against black and Latinos in housing transactions, but they were discriminating in the new racing style. Yeah? In the past, discrimination was in your face. Hey, black person, hey, Latino, you cannot think about renting an apartment in this building. So go off. From the 1960s onwards, that became illegal. And if you do that in my face, I have a case in court. So the, the way that we discovered they were discriminating was that when they do this technical house, uh, housing audits, they send testers, black, white, Latino, and they compare notes. And what they found is that blacks and Latinos were experiencing discrimination about 50% of the time, except that the discrimination was not, hey, black person, hey, Tyrone, get out of place. Eduardo, get out. They were told things like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have apartments now. 
but please leave me your profile and your phone number. I'll contact you later. So sometimes neither the blacks or Latino testers were aware of, that they were experiencing discrimination. And we still have redlining as we say, and in stores, we are monitored or ignored or killed with politeness. May I help you? May I help you? May I help you? You are dangerous. You are trying to steal stuff from me in jobs, etc. And if you want more on that, there is a book. <laughs> Chapter two of that book has an outline of the new racism. So new racism is dominant, but let's be honest, the old Daniel is still with us. So we still have the clan. This is in the town where I live. We have the Proud Boys. We have the Boogaloo Boys, all kinds of boys. Yeah? And this is an example of what people call articulation. The new is with us, but the old have not died completely. And in pockets of the nation, you have this thinking and these practices yeah, that arguably, actually, we don't need to say arguably, that clearly have increased in significance in the last uh, 10 years. Before Trump, this is not Trump, this is before Trump. Yeah. So I already defined racism, I talk about the new racism. So what is the ideological expression of the new way of conducting racial business? And I have called that colorblind racism, but I, will refer, I refer to an ideology that emerged in the 1970s that uses the abstract principles of liberalism to explain away racial affairs, yeah? Those of you who come from Latin America know that this is similar to the racial democracy mythology of Brazil, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Mexico, etc. Oh, I need to have a break. Do you catch my subliminal message? <laughs> okay, it wasn't too subliminal, but I'm black and Puerto Rican. I ain't got time to be subliminal. So let me give you one example that I keep using again and again because I think it's, uh, it's uh, apropos. So the question that was asked to Jim, who is a computer salesman in his 40s was, are you for or against affirmative action? And at this point, it's irrelevant that he's opposed to affirmative action. What I want to examine is his explanation for his opposition. So I think, I think it's unfair top to bottom on everybody and the whole process. It often, you know, discrimination itself is a bad word, right? But you discriminate every day. You want a beer at the store and there are six kinds of beers you can get from natural light to Sam Adams, right? And you look at the price and you look at the kind of beer and you, it's a choice. And a lot of that you have laid out in front of you. Which one you get? Now, should the government sponsor Sam Adams and make it cheaper than natural light because it's brewed by someone in Boston, that doesn't make much sense, right? Why would we want that or make some Adams eight times as expensive because we want people to buy natural light? And I'm assuming that half of the audience may be like, so what is problematic? It seems like a principled position. Well, it's abstract and decontextualized because the person assumes that discrimination disappears. And I already told you discrimination in the labor market affects black and Latino job applicants 30 to 50% of the time. Let me repeat, 30 to 50% of the time we Latinos and African-Americans experience discrimination in the labor market. Secondly, Jim assumes like most whites that the market is universal and neutral and research shows that People are hired not just because of their qualifications. A lot of the jobs are secured through networks, yeah? And white networks are more uh, efficacious, uh, stronger, they have more connections. They are connected to jobs. I already gave you the example of even on the so-called bad jobs. And by the way, being a plumber or an electrician, I think is actually a good job, pays quite well, yeah? So the advantages are for white. So the market is not meritocratic. So therefore Jim can express his opposition to affirmative action in a seemingly principled way, but I think it's an example of colorblind racism. And in the academy, <laughs> we can talk about that in the question and answer se session, a lot of the transactions are of the colorblind uh, nation. So let me now talk about historically white colleges and universities. 
And these are places with the history, demography, curriculum, climate, and set and symbols and traditions that embody, signify, and reproduce whiteness. And I think it's important naming things, yeah? So if we talk about HBCUs, and last year I went to the University of Houston downtown, which is a Hispanic serving institution. So those places, their, their racial angle is tattooed in their very, very name. So I think that we have to begin calling a spade a spade. And if we are laboring in Duke or Rice or Texas A&M or UT, and these are HWCUs, let's call them for what they are and explain that the organization and cultural whiteness is the factor pushing the isolated incidents that keep happening again and again and again. Therefore, they are not isolated. Yeah? As a social scientist, when you see a pattern, <laughs> you have to connect the dots and say, gee, every time that the weather improves, another fraternity will do some silly thing. Yeah? So on the left, you have a sorority at Penn State. I was born in Belfont, Pennsylvania, because my parents were studying in Penn State 58 years ago. And uh, so in this, this sorority, they had decided to do a Mexican theme party. No Mexicans in the fraternity, but they decided to do a Mexican theme party. And one of the young uh, women in the front has a sign that reads, I don't cut grass, I smoke it. On the right, you have a similar event, except that now the target is Asian American students. And they objected, obviously, and had a rally saying that race is not a party. And does this happen at Rice University? Of course. So you have incidents like this. Come on, don't fake it. But I want to suggest that besides the isolated incidents, the whiteness of the organization and the cultural whiteness affects bigger things. So the curriculum is sort of white oriented. We have been complaining about that for centuries. I wrote a book on that. So if you want more, white logic, white method. Yeah? Life in the college is white oriented, even though most students and most faculty and most staff don't realize that it's a white oriented lifestyle. Even the food is white. Yeah? If I have another chicken wrap sandwich, Jennifer, I will sick and fat. I want to have some diversity in the food, diversity in everything. And then these places have symbols and traditions and a culture that reproduce whiteness. So on the left, you have the statue of Silent Sam at UNC, Confederate uh, uh, statue. In the middle, you have a president's room. And the president's room is usually pictures and paintings of mostly white men. So again, the impact of that for those of us like me who have given lectures again and again in the president's room is like, gee, this looks at the clan room, you know? And then on the, the next picture is of uh, Venus as a symbol of beauty. Nothing room, wrong with a uh, white beauty. The problem is that you only have symbols of white beauty in your university. They're also sending a message by omission, yeah? And then we Blacks, we Asian, we Indigenous peoples, particularly we Black beauty people, yeah? So where is my expression of beauty? I want my own statue. We also have building after building, named after white folks, which makes us feel like Ralph Ellison said, as invisible people in these places. And of course, you do have an issue with statues too, no? So how do we feel in these places? And I want to give you a quote from a book by my uh, former colleague, Joe Fagan, in a book titled The Agony of Education. So this is a, a prospective black student at Rice University, no, not at Rice. It was somewhere in the, I think it was Yale or Prince or something like that. So he said, one reason I didn't go there was because it reeked of whiteness. And that is no joke. And I'm not exaggerating. I was there only for two days, and after one day, I wanted to leave. And I mean, really, it just reeked everywhere I went, reeked of all white men, just lily whiteness oozing from the corner. 
and then he laughed. I cannot do the laugh because I wanted, oh, I wanted to leave and I knew that socially I would just be miserable. And I talked to other black students. I talked to all of them because they aren't a lot. And so I said, do you like it here? And they were like, no, we are miserable. So if you want more on this, I'm getting old, so now I'm, everything is about me. So I did write a paper at, attempting to explain the emotional side of racism. So it's feeling race, theorizing the racial economy of emotion. So what is the impact of the white orientation of these organizations called colleges? I call them HWCUs on us. So we are really not integrated. We are at best, most of us, feel like guests in the academic White House. We cohabitate specially in, this pl in these places, but we don't feel we are part integ integrated to the place. And because we're not seen as belonging, then often we are viewed with suspicions. The campus police, as well as RWF, regular white folks, acting as deputized agents of racial control, police us particularly at night. This morning I was sharing with a number of colleagues my experiences as a professor on campus, uh, particularly at night. So I mentioned that my second year at Michigan, I went back to my office at night with a bunch of books and a graduate student in another department looked at me, gave me that look of, you know, where, where are you going? You don't belong here. So he asked me, are you lost? I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to my office. Do you want to help me carry the books? And then he got all discombobulated and did the, uh, let me go. And he left. Then I moved to Texas A&M and this happened like maybe 20 years ago. I'm with my former student, Tyrone Foreman, who is now a professor at uh, in University of Illinois, Chicago. And Tyrone is always late. <laughs> So he decided the night before we were supposed to go and fly out to a meeting of ASA in New York, he told me, hey man, I need to print something. I'm like, you want me to go to campus at 10 p.m.? I'm like, come on. So we go to campus and then the campus police immediately stop us while I'm parking, okay? So I have the parking permit. I'm legit 300%. And the police officer kept asking me, so where are you going? I'm like, I'm, not, I'm going to my office. Your office? Yes, I'm a professor here. Professor of what? Sociology. In what building? Academic building. And you teach what? As I told you, sociology. Mm -hmm. And he kept pestering us for a good two minutes. And then at some point he said, okay guys, so take it easy and be careful because the campus is very dangerous at night. And he left with his car driving very slowly. The impact of that for me is that I decided from then on, I will not be uh, subject to this again. So I don't go to campus at night. And that obviously has an impact on my career because theoretically I should have the right to go to campus whenever I want. But because the campus is also a racialized space, ultimately it's about my life, yeah? Because if I had told that police officer, hey man, I'm going to report you or whatever, that incident could have escalated. And as you know, in Texas, everybody carries weapons. So I probably could have died. So I decided not to do anything. So racism is expressed not just in colleges, but in hospitals, the military, neighborhoods, schools, churches, banks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And let me give kudos to one of my former students who wrote a beautiful paper explaining the racialized nature of organizations, uh, Victor Reid, a professor of sociology at Iowa. So now comes the harder part of my talk, but we're going to do this together, okay? We're family, we're friends. Systemic racism is you. It's actually all of us. And please, I'm not calling anyone names. I haven't called anyone racist. I'm actually saying something deeper and actually perhaps more problematic. So I'm saying that most of us are likely very nice people, although some of you are angry birds. I can see it in your face. But we all participate in various ways and degrees and in different positions in systemic racism. If something is systemic, it operates in a way that attempts to incorporate all actors. So if you think about capitalism, 
or patriarchy, capitalism is not just about a few rich people, yeah? It's about classes and everybody's in the class structure. And in terms of patriarchy, it's not about a few sexist men. All men participate in patriarchy in different ways. Yeah? So for whites in terms of systemic racism, I think that most of the participation tends to become normative, habituated, like second nature. Yeah? You do it because it's habitual. Yeah? In whites, and that's what I'm working on right now, I was mentioning to Jennifer and Ollie this morning, I'm working to address sort of the conscious and unconscious part of racial action that uh, merge in the souls of white folks to use the expression of W.E.B. Du Bois. So how do we people of color participate and notice I put quotation marks to signify that it's not a, a symmetrical participation. So most of us didn't ask to become slaves or to be killed during the genocidal period of the conquest period, yeah? So most of us have been conscious and unwilling participants. Yeah? We know when someone is enslaving me, I'm not unconscious. Yeah? I know someone is brutalizing me. And I'm unwilling because I didn't ask, hey, Massa, can you enslave me? No. So we have endured the negative economic, social, psychological, and health effects of systemic racism. But we must also recognize that systems of domination attempt to include a few of the people that it dominates. So from slavery onwards, some people of color have been part of the system. And I know this is hard to hear, but it's the truth. So I mentioned this morning that, I think I mentioned it, that during the slavery period of race stratification in the US, all the most enslaved Africans, most Africans were uh, enslaved folks a small group of, the, of uh, black folks were in the business of owning other people. And some of them, not many, but some of them own a lot. Like there was a family in Louisiana, the Metoyer family, that owned 212 enslaved Africans, which explains why that family, the patriarch, attempted to fight on the side of the Confederacy during the Civil War. And the Confederacy told him, hey man, you're still black, so I'm sorry. So you may own other people, but you're not the same as us. So how do nice whites participate in systemic racism? So let me begin by telling you the same caveat. Historically, some whites have fought, fought against white supremacy. So you will not John Brown and the abolitionists. We know the liberal whites during the civil rights era. And today we have seen many whites participate in the black Lives movement mobilization. However, the question is, where do you live? Who are your friends? Is your church, temple, synagogue integrated? What school do you send your children to? What was your historical racial habitus when you were young and has it changed? Who challenges your ideas, thoughts, and emotions on race? And I hope you are getting my, my point. My point is this. You navigate a white habitus that deeply shapes you. Because all these things that I talk about, where do you live, where are your friends, what church do you go, who challenge your views, all these things contribute to the racialization of your cognitions and emotions, and therefore, arguably, are more important for the reproduction of systemic racism than the actions of bad actors. Let me say something deep, at least in my view. <laughs> Maybe it's not that deep. Systems of domination do not depend on bad actors. Whether we're talking of patriarchy or capitalism or systemic racism, the system depends on the incorporation of most actors in the system. You cannot maintain domination by relying on a few sexes or a few elites or a few races. You need to develop a system that attempts to incorporate most people. So let me talk about what is to be done. You as an organization, you as an institution of knowledge production must begin changing practices and rethinking everything. Some things to consider. You want to diversify? Don't keep hiring one and losing two 
hiring two and losing one, and on balance, you are in the same boat. If you want to bring America to the or rise to the demographic reality of the nation and of your state, Texas, you have to hire in clusters. You need to also have postdoctoral fellowships so that you can bring some folks and maybe they stay around. You have to have lots of lectures and you have to have increased funding for diversity programs. And I put them in quotation marks because diversity programs come in varieties, yeah? There is a version of diversity that doesn't do much. So what you need is in your face diversity programs that will push for what I call in my work, deep diversity. This will cost money, no question about it. But you have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to address the organizational and cultural whiteness of your university. The goal is nothing short than to reimagine and to reinvent your campus and to transform it into a multicultural space. And folks are not targeting rice. I'm asking Duke to do exactly the same thing. And I think that colleges are indeed special places. We are all paid to produce knowledge and to gain knowledge. Therefore, we can transform these spaces and make them beacons of racial fairness and justice in America. So individually, you heard what I said. If you have a segregated lifestyle, begin mixing it up. But be aware that your struggle for becoming an anti-racist is a lifelong, it's likely a lifelong struggle because you cannot just from day one to day two say, okay, I read the, I listened to Bonilla Silva, I read his book, I'm woke. It's not the way it works. Similar for men in terms of patriarchy. It's not enough for you to claim that you are against patriarchy. Ultimately, you have to recognize that patriarchy is beyond your control and you may be receiving benefits from the patriarchal organization of society, even if you're not aware of it. However, the fundamental way that the historical evidence shows that systems change is through protest movements. If you want deep change, yeah, you have to participate in movement. That's what we did during the, our independence war, during the civil rights movement, during the white women's <laughs> suffrage movement. I want to always mention white women because remember that black and Latina women did not get the vote in 1920. Yeah? They had to wait until the 1960s. And today we still have movement not only in the US, but in the world. Right now, we have a freedom movement in Belarus. And here in the OESA, we're having the a renewed and expanded Black Lives Matter movement. So let me finish with a statement from John Lewis. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble. Thank you. Super. Muchas gracias, Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silva. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer Bratter. Hello, everyone. I am Daniel Dominguez, Associate Professor of History at Rice, and I will be moderating the Q&A session. If you have a question, please send it to us by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We already had some uh, questions of uh, viewers who registered uh, with us. so. <clears throat> One of them is, uh, if you may, Professor, how do we speak to loved ones about race who do not see systemic racism or white supremacy as pervasive and deeply problematic? Uh, that is, uh, as you can imagine, I've heard that question before. And it is hard, yeah? Because yes. they are your loved ones. They can be your, your grandmother, grandfather. It can be your brother. It can be your father or mother. So how do you deal with that? I think that on this, this is, I don't compromise my morality and my politics. So in a loving way, and let me use a term that uh, I've been using lately, uh, is the, 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 the we, we got to confront, yeah? We have to, we have to fight. It's not enough for us. This idea of sort of a safety space, let's be nice, we have to confront we have to fight, we have to tell it as it is. And we can do that in a way in which we're not insulting people, yeah? I never, in my, uh, in my interactions with uh, family members, 
including my, my nuclear family. I, I, my father, for example, who happens to be a black man, first time I talk about systemic racism, he told me, I'm going to say, say what he told me in Spanish. He told me, eres un negrito acomplejado. You are a black man, a little black man with a complex, yeah? Uh, I'm not going to lie, it wasn't my, my nicest moment. I, 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 gave, I gave it to him. But I think that since then, he and I have, uh, have had a better relationship because now we talk straight, yeah? And he knows where I stand, I know where he stands, and I have seen him changing from a person, a black man who didn't recognize systemic racism to a person that today recognizes that race matters. So it, it can be done. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, a question uh, sent through the Q&A. Uh, can you discuss please the connection between systemic racism and generational wealth? I think you already mentioned a little bit, but if you could expand on it, please. Yeah, the, 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 on that, let me give you a reference. There is a book called uh, uh, White Wealth, Black Wealth by uh, Melvin Oliver and Thomas Shapiro. And it shows that policies from the government as well as practices from individual high, whites created a huge disadvantage in the housing market back in the day. And those disadvantages then, let me use the language they use, they sedimented, yeah? So the wealth accumulation for whites, which started back in the day, has continued. Now, in addition of housing, I'm going to give you another reference. There is a book, When Affirmative Action Was White. So think about all the policies before the 1960s that benefited white folks disproportionately, like homesteading, yeah? In the US, we're giving land away to white folks to move to the West. Black folks and Latinos were not part of that policy. Again, that is another policy that allowed the average white person to accumulate wealth. Same thing in terms of jobs. For the longest uh, time, jobs, for example, in cities were given to ethnic whites. The Irish, for example, were able to achieve uh, racial mobility by getting into these jobs, and from those jobs, getting into the middle class. So, now, the problem is that that sedimentation of inequality continues today through other practices of exclusion in the housing market, in, the, in banking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what began 100, 200 years ago continues today through new practices. Thank you. Uh, a question now about uh, uh, <clears throat> colleges. Uh, what ideas do you have for colleges with federal funding who are being told to seize their diversity programs? So <laughs> wait till November 3rd and maybe, <laughs> maybe things will change. But in the, in the short term, I'm not going to lie to you. This is affecting all of us. Uh, I, for example, was invited to give a talk to a federal agency and the talk was canceled after I was spent, I'm not going to lie to you, I spent like 20 hours preparing for this talk because it was a health related organization. So I read a lot, prepared what I thought was a wonderful presentation and then they just chicken out, yeah? Mm -hmm. So in the short term, uh, it's sending, it's, it, ha it has a chilling effect on all of us in terms of how, what we do, how we do it. In terms of organizations, I think that some of it is, you got to resist. Because I think, A, things might change in a month or so, in two weeks. But also we have to realize that most likely the courts are going to be on our side. So if you were to be deemed in violation of a so-called policy and you take the case to court, I think the court will say, come on, you cannot violate freedom of speech. Why can a university not have a diversity training program? So, so that would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, Rafael Yores is wondering, since race-based exclusion and class-based exclusion are related and mutually reinforcing, how could the struggle against systemic racism also address class issues? Well, the class order is uh, Stuart Hall, uh, who, who was a, a, a Caribbean scholar who did his career in England said that class is the modality through which race is lived. I can turn Stuart Hall and say that the race class interaction is permanent. I, 
It has been a permanent feature of modernity. The class structures in the wealth system are racialized, whether we're talking in Brazil or in Puerto Rico. So for example, in Puerto Rico, we call rich people blanquitos, whiteies, because historically, all the elites in Puerto Rico were white. So the race class order is connected. And I'm not going to get into a deep discussion on this, but if you want, I'm always giving references. Cedric Robinson wrote a book called, titled Black Marxism, and he articulates this idea of racialized capitalism, saying that the capitalist system that created the class structure of modernity was racialized from the beginning, and you cannot undo race. You cannot separate this. What this means is that our struggle for freedom and emancipation may begin in race or may begin in gender, but it has to connect at least the three fundamental axes of social stratification in modernity, which are race, class, and gender. I happen to believe that the fastest way of getting to a class agenda in the US in a seemingly contradictory way is through race. So race might be the best way of achieving a, a, a more fair uh, distribution of resources in terms of classes. So race will be the, the, the way to enter the class struggle, if you will, in the future. Because increasingly the working classes in America happen to be black and Latino. Thank you. Uh... I know we are a little over our time, but uh, there are a bunch of questions and maybe I can condense uh, some of them so we can address them uh, effectively. Uh, some uh, folks here uh, are asking, uh, if I am a white person, how, how do I do to see racism and how do I do to stop engaging in systemic racism? I'm going to answer by analogy. So I am a man, how do I engage in struggle against patriarchy? So the first thing you do is don't trust yourself. <laughs> so that, yeah, it, it's as simple as that. If you are a man who thinks that you are woke on gender, you, you, you got it coming to you. So what you need to do is engage in social activities and events and solidarity with women. And trust me, you will make mistakes and they will let you know immediately that you're making a mistake. But through the process of interaction in struggles against patriarchy, you then slowly but surely move towards a closer sort of version of an ally. And the same applies in terms of race. So how do you know if you are behaving wrongly or not seeing how race affects a particular transaction? That means that you need to then change your habits. And if you live a totally white life, begin mixing it up because folks of color, I will tell you, okay? I tell my white friends, hey man, that's some racist stuff. <laughs> I don't call it stuff, yeah? Um, so I think that part of the drama is A, uh, changing, changing your, your habitus so you interact more with people of color, but also recognizing the limitations which, which are that most likely we will not see liberation we will not see a deracialized subject, whether you are a white person or a black person, until we remove racialization from the world. But as that will take a long time, that cannot be used as an excuse for not doing anything. The job of every person of conscience or morality is to struggle against the monster you have in front of you. So whatever the monster is, systemic racism of the new racism kind, you fight that. When people don't use the language of the past, but talk about race in colorblind fashion, your job is to tell them that that you said that you think is not racialized is problematic because of this and that and that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one last question. I know we are a little over time already. <clears throat> well, systemic racism has proven to be uh, pervasive and uh, uh, lasting in this country. Should we consider or think about compensation for its victims? Absolutely, and we need to have a national discussion of how to do that. And let me make a joke. 
So I am black and Puerto Rican. So I want compensation for my black experience and for my experience as a colonized subject. So if you're going to be giving money away, I want two checks. Okay, that's a joke. That's not real. <laughs> so what I think we need to do is for, for real, begin a national conversation about how we're going to do this. And there are formulas. A colleague of mine at Duke, uh, Professor William Darity Jr. has written a book just came out in the middle of the pandemic on reparations. So there are people putting out their ways of doing reparations that don't go back to the idea of the check. Yeah? So he's talking about baby bonds. He's, some of you have heard the, the idea of giving every person born in the US and, uh, some money so that, that person can accumulate wealth. Yeah? He's also talking about uh, investment in communities of color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the first thing is, yes, we need to think about reparations and we need to have a national discussion about how to do that. Because otherwise, let's take the alternative. The alternative is this idea of, okay, let's remove discrimination from America and then we achieve equality. And this is like a math game. If you have a race between two actors, actor black and actor white, an actor white has resources and advantages and begins the race, it's a hundred yard race, and the person begins 50 yards ahead, how can the black person catch up? So therefore, if we want to be fair, but we have to recognize that, that systemic racing has given whites advantages in terms of wealth, income, social estimation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore we have to undo those advantages to create a truly egalitarian society. Well, Professor, I think we'll stop right here. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your talk. The thank workshop you for the invitation. As well. Really enjoyed and uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Eduardo Bonilla Silva is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Duke University and author of uh, Racism Without Races, among many other books and articles. Next in our lecture series, Paul Butler will talk about prison abolition and a mule that, that will happen Tuesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. Central Time. Please register at cast.rice.edu slash events. Thanks to our sponsors, Task Force on Slavery, Segregation and Racial Injustice and Bridge, building research on inequality and diversity to grow equity. Thanks to Dr. Jennifer Bretter for joining us today. Th special thanks to our staff working behind the scenes, Tara, Andrew, John. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of CAS, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you again, Professor.